Okay, here we go, recording. Okay, so thank you very much, Gerald. We are very, very much honored to host uh, this um, week's seminar at the Department of uh, Marine Geosciences. Dr. Gerald Hauer from um, University of Graz in uh, Austria. Um, after completing a PhD in geobiology and stratigraphy at the University of Graz in 2016, he spent three years at the Japan Agency of Marine Earth Sciences and Technology, uh, JAMSTEC, as a young research fellow. Since April 2020, Gerald is, uh, uh, is an assistant professor in paleontology and stratigraphy at the Institute of Earth Sciences and at the University of Graz, as part of the Naui Graz Geocenter. His research focuses on bio and cyclostatigraphic approaches to age model generation. He combines this age data with paleoceanographic and paleoclimatologic reconstruction into multi proxies uh, framework detailing past environmental conditions. He is interested in the interaction of tectonic gateway restrictions to the global oceanographic circulation patterns and how these changes may have affected the Earth's past climatic evolution. In his research, he focuses mainly on tropical to subtropical shallow marine carbonates, following his participation in the International Ocean Discovery Project, or IODP, Expedition 356, Indonesian Thrust Flow, in 2015, he became heavily involved in research dealing with the neogen evolution of the Indian Ocean and the influence of climate and tectonic influences on large scale cross hemispheric circulation patterns such as the Indian or Australian monsoons and the evolution of the Shaul Indian Ocean Bierkness mechanism. Okay, if I did a mistake, please correct me. No, that's totally fine. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk a bit about my research. And without further ado, I would like to present a bit of my research that came out of my stay at the Chamstick in Japan about the plyopleistocene lubin current dynamics and how this all interacts with tectonic sea level driven changes and also the Indian Ocean circulation and climate. And as you can see here, I have a lot of co-authors and they were all really, really incredibly helpful in generating this data and, and interpreting this data. And IODP is of course a very collaborative uh, endeavor. And I think the uh, collaborations that arose from this very nicely highlight the opportunities of IODP and, uh, and also ICDP in certain cases. And so, I want to like to honor this a bit with this talk. Okay, this my, ah, very nice. So as mentioned, uh, a lot of this research came about from IODP Expedition 356, Indonesian through flow, which we drilled in the austral winter from July to September, 2015. And we drilled a transect along the west coast of Australia along the Northwest Shelf and the Kana One Ramp, where we drilled several sites. And um, yeah, it was quite a lot of fun. And now I'm gonna talk a bit about the data about this. So again, as a reminder, most of the research came about from my stay at Chamstick here. So these were my colleagues back then, this is the Institute. And the very nice thing about Chamstick is it has a very large research fleet and has a heavy involvement, of course, in IODP, especially with the GQ. And so this was a very nice place to stay and do research on these IODP samples during that time. Um, maybe as a bit of an introduction, why we drilled uh, during Expedition 356 was our interest in the Indonesian fruit flow, as it is a very important part of the global thermohaline circulation. It is basically the warm water transport in the tropical area from the Pacific, specifically the Indo-Pacific warm pool into the Indian Ocean. So it's basically the warm water loop that completes the global thermohaline circulation and transports all the warm water back into the Atlantic and further in the Gulf Stream. So it's a very important switchboard that controls climate and also latitudinal heat transport through the Indian Ocean, especially with the Agulhas leakage and the Tulas return flow. Uh, 
transports quite a lot of water, so 10 to 15 square drops of low salinity warm water from the Indonesian Indo-Pacific warm pool into the Indian Ocean. And what is very important about this um, is the ongoing tectonic restriction of the area because of the continuous northward movement of Australia and its collision with the Eurasian plates in the Indonesian archipelago. And on the uh, left-hand side for myself here, you can see the modern configuration of the islands in Indonesia. But if you look at this in the past, for instance, five million years ago, because of this tectonic movement, the configuration of the islands was radically different and a lot of the areas, so everything that is marked in red here, was still submerged at this time. So we have a very clear progression in island uplift since the last five million years and also in the, uh, deeper in the past. But this restriction had then, of course, very likely tremendous effects on how warm water exchange occurred between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And Indonesia, um, Expedition 356 had the very direct interest to study the so-called Leuven current going on here. Um, as it is a direct expression of this Indonesian true flow, and it is a shallow southward flowing warm water current along the west coast of Australia. Um, it is also the only southward flowing western boundary current in the southern hemisphere, which it runs basically counter to the general career circulation in the global ocean chairs. And because of this, it transports this warm tropical water south. Doing this, it extends coral reefs up to 29 degrees southern latitude along the Australian west coast. And it also extends the tropical subtropical transition down to 30 degrees southern latitude. So it has a tremendous effect on the environment of, along the west coast of Australia. And since it's directly sourced from the Indonesian through flow, it also can act as a tracer um, of this ongoing restriction in the Indonesian archipelago. Um, directly coming out of Expedition 356, uh, one of our first publications that was spearheaded by Beth Christensen focused on our site U1463, very uh, analyzed basically the interaction of this proposed Indonesian free flow restriction between five million years and around uh, three million years in the study of Kane and Molnar in the beginning and its interaction with Australian climate. And what we found during this study was actually that Australian climate was heavily dependent on the geometry of the Indonesian through flow and thus also the moisture transport and also the extent of the ITC set during that time. So there is an interaction to the monsoon system in this case. And the restriction of the Indonesian through flow apparently moved the Australian climate from the relatively humid um, conditions in the northern parts of Australia to very dry conditions as we know them today. And this was a very drastic and relatively fast shift that occurred very similar to other proposed um, um, changes that were caused by the direct restriction of this Indonesian through flow around 3.5 to 3 million years. This was a very nice uh, outcome of this research where we could show that the Indonesian through flow was directly uh, responsible for this, and we also had a very nice interaction of this. Um, to further this research, we then moved on to um, select two target intervals uh, for a more specific research where we wanted to look at all these processes that we had now on a large um, geological scales and tectonic scales into sub Milankovitch scales if possible, but at least on Milankovitch cyclicity and to study them further and see the direct interaction of Indonesian free flow and maybe also local environmental conditions, in particular productivity changes, and then maybe organic metaflux changes with different proxies in this case. For this, we selected two intervals in the Pliocene and the Pleistocene. One encompasses a 500,000 year interval along the M2 event, which is described as the first significant glaciation in the Pliocene and sometimes also described as a failed glaciation. It's this tiny little blue blob here, uh, which basically shows that it's the first significant cold period in the otherwise relatively warm Pliocene. 
And the second part, which I want to talk about a bit, are the significant changes during the middle Pleistocene transition, which occurred around one million years ago, where you have to switch from a dominant obliquity forcing in glacial interglacial cyclicities towards a more or less quasi 100,000 year pacing of our classical Pleistocene glacials. And for this, we had a look um, on our sites and wanted to see the interactions of the Indonesian through flow and also the Lewin current to the, during these times of significant climatic changes. Oops, are we going? Yes. And so the initial study that we had was um, showed actually very nicely that our site U1463 um, continued to actually reflect a, a Indo-Pacific signal, so a West Pacific warm pole signal during this M2 event, while a very closely adjacent site apparently moved outside the influence of the Indonesian through flow or, or the Lubin current more specifically, and started to reflect the more open Indian Ocean signal during the M2 interval, during basically this long-term relative glacial low stand between 3.4 and 3.2 million years. While all our other sites with comparisons from the West Pacific Warm Pool site here seem to reflect this continuously. So there seems to be a interaction in this that the through flow never specifically ceased or was um, restricted so much that the environmental conditions um, were completely affected all over the western shelf of Australia, but there were significant effects that seem to be mostly related to the sea level during this time uh, and during this restriction. So then the question remained, was this a trickle-down effect from an actual tectonic threshold that was reached at some point, or was this just a classical glacial-driven sea level restriction and the reorganization of the oceanographic currents around this area. And to better uh, understand this interaction of oceanography, um, glacial sea level low stand during the uh, M2 event during uh, around 3.3 million years ago, um, we started uh, a study that focused on calcareous nanofossils as a tracer for these uh, water masses and their interaction with different productivity proxies around this time. And for this, which of course generated a lot of calcareous nanofossil data, which um, in general looks like this if you have the raw data. I'm not going to go too much into detail about this because this is usually a huge multivariate data set. But what you can do with this various nanofossil um, assemblage data is you can cluster them. So basically, you bin together uh, samples with similar uh, nanofossil composition and see how they changed in the progression of your sedimentary record and then also with an age model attached to it in terms of time. For this, we then were able to generate um, various era, areas of sediment that were affected by, or basically contained a similar nanofossil community. And this means they also reflect similar environmental conditions. And to see this, we basically uh, see a predominantly tropical assemblage in the lower part of our course, then we move to a more transitional assemblage, and then we have a short interval with a relatively cold assemblage, and then a very highly variable assemblage in the highest parts of our core. Continuing this into the age domain, we can then also look at specific so-called index taxa that basically are major players in the assemblage and that define it. And there we have uh, some specific calcareous nanofossils like Umbilicus fera siboge, which is a very classical tropical uh, calcareous um, um, yeah, a haptophyte that is very indicative of tropical warm water conditions. Then we have very opportunistic taxa, uh, some very near shore a taxa of small cephidocapsids around that time that prefer stable uh, environmental conditions and are very sensitive to thermocline changes. Then also we have some other 
examples of taxa that prefer elevated nutrient conditions or even colder temperatures. So with these um, changes in the assemblage of these tiny little fossils, around a few microns only in size, we can then start to interpret how these changes that we also see in different records that were already published, for instance, our humidity record from Australia and also the temperature records from the open Indian Ocean. And so how these assemblages interact during this time and then we can also try and see if there are significant changes that we can ascribe with this. And to do this, we compiled all our nanofossil assemblage data also with some productivity data. In this case, um, a colleague of mine um, contributed the carbon isotope data from uh, Trilobatos saculifer, which is the surface swelling planktic foraminifer. And there we can actually quite nicely see that we see a decreasing tropical influence in the beginning around uh, 3.54 million years. And then we move into a more transitional assemblage and we have the M2 event very nicely um, recorded also in our nanofossil assemblages down here. And then also we have this very variable post M2 glacial interglacial cyclicity where also a specific nanofossil taxon follows the global deep water isotope curve of Eliseki and Remo, the LRO4, quite nicely. And during this time, we also see an increase in surface upwelling and thus productivity, um, which is also reflected in our carbon isotope signatures quite nicely. And so with these changes combined, we can then also start thinking about the tectonic interactions and the global climatic interactions during this time. And for this, we basically started um, a reconstruction of the paleo environment. And for this, we also uh, went back to the reconstruction of Kane and Molnar and the potentially emergence of different um, islands in the Indonesian archipelago and how they might have affected that the Indonesian free flow around this time. So in the beginning, we had the decreasing tropical influence. And in our model, this basically relates to a very strong, very tropical connection that was still active around that time. And then a certain threshold was seized where we moved into this first transitional period where we had a very strong nanofossil shift and also a, the end of the decreasing uh, precipitation in Australia and we interpret this as a threshold where at least several islands were high enough to limit the moisture transport from the ITC set directly into the northern part of Australia, although some was still continuing. But the most important thing around this time, we consider that around 3.5 million years ago, a threshold must have been reached where more than enough islands were uplifted around this time to have a significant source shift in terms of waters that go through the Indonesian free flow, where we basically propose a northward shift to, to less saline and less tropical waters arriving there. They're still very warm, of course, so still tropical to slightly subtropical at most, but there was a significant shift in the water masses that was recorded by our nanofossil assemblages. The next piece that we found is that the M2 event, as was also previously proposed by our first study that focused on this time interval, that the sea level low stand during the this first significant uh, glaciation, the so-called M2 event around 3.3 million years ago, further significantly changed the free flow mechanism. And this was mainly a sea level control and not necessarily a direct tectonic control. Although, of course, the ongoing tectonic restriction only made it possible that sea level falls managed to restrict dishes as, as, as much as they did. And this was also the inception of a very closely ongoing glacial interglacial cyclicity around this time that is also very well recorded um, after the M2 event. And so our thinking in this regard is that this um, Pliocene change was uh, directly responsible because we had continuous uplift of these areas. So the shelf areas increased. And during glacial low stands, more shelf areas were exposed during this time. 
And this favored this so-called Sahul Indian Ocean Bjorkness mechanism, which is basically and very simply described a mini El Nino system that can establish in the Indian Ocean and thus generates an uh, anomalous wind system during glacial low stands that favor upwelling in the western, uh, along the west coast of Australia in the eastern Indian Ocean. And so we see this progressive increase um, during beginning sea level variability that was increased after this first glaciation, the so-called M2 event. And there we really see a very interesting progression of the climatic interactions based on these tectonic and sea level driven changes during the Pliocene. Good, this more or less uh, concludes our first foray into the Pliocene and showing this very nice progression of tectonic um, induced changes that are then amplified by beginning glacial interglacial variability following this first initial in, um, glacial during the M2 event. Um, our next interest was then of course the so-called middle Pleistocene revolution and um, in this case, we have a look at the time interval from around 1.1 million year to 0 0.6 million years in the past, where this very strong shift from the 41,000 year obliquity dominated glacial interglacial cycl uh, cyclicity that was persistent beginning with the M2 event in our global records to this quasi periodic 100,000 year cyclic changes. For this study, we moved to site U1460, which is a bit further south along the shelf, the western shelf of Australia. And U1460 is in so far um, also very interesting because this site lies directly into the path of the Lubin current, which you can see here quite nicely in the uh, chlorophyll data on this satellite image. So everything that's basically greenish to turquoise in this image is the Lubin current that affects the productivity around this area. And U1460 sits right at the edges of this interval. And so any kind of changes that affect the shelf areas during glacial interglacial cyclicities and also changing the strength or position or turbulence of the Indonesian um, the Lubin current in this case might also heavily affect U1460 in this case. And so we also selected a sampling interval at this second site that we uh, studied in this case. And U1460 has for one thing, a very interesting paleoceanographic potential in this case, but it also has a very interesting um, sedimentological, um, well, well, composition in this case, because it is a very shallow marine site where we also have proto-dolomite formation. We have a basic sponge reef that we drilled into. We have orthogenic gloconite formation. So there's also a lot of sedimentary and also early diagenetic interactions, which we will also currently studying. And this is so ongoing proce uh, proce uh, yeah, well, research processes that we are uh, currently invested in, but uh, for this current example, we are in the beginning only focusing on the paleo environmental implications of the sea level changes during the MPT. Um, for this, of, cur of course, um, the first and foremost important thing for analyzing and studying such um, changes in the past, a proper and uh, verifiable age model is of course the most important thing. For this, we again used uh, Calcareous nanofossil as a primary biostratigraphic marker. Here I just show the last occurrence of larger reticular fenestra as annoy, which in this case we took as a marker for the last occurrence, which should have globally occurred around 910,000 years in the past. 
and using this H model combined with shipboard biostratigraphic data, which is also based on calcareous nanofossils and planktonic foraminifers, we were able to generate a orbitally tuned H model, which in this case focuses on the changes also in the nanofossil assemblage. In this case, the variability of small Gefyrocapsa in the record. And as you can see here, there's a very clear orbitally paced variability in these uh, abundances, which are basically related to the uh, light intensity, the variability of the ITC set, and thus also in part the monsoonal variability that affect the northern parts of Australia with the Australian summer monsoon in this case. And using this interaction, we were able to orbitally tune our depth-based data from the IODB cores, and then also interpret them in terms of time over the MPT interval between 1.1 and 0 0.6 million years in the past. The first thing that we noticed during this study was that there was a heavy effect of sea level driven changes that began to amplify after the so-called 900 kilo year event, which is marked in this unfortunately rather small figure here. Um, beginning with a dramatic sea level low stand of around 45 meters below present, which um, was very much a first threshold that began to affect this relatively shallow site. Um, as a very important mention, U1460 uh, lies currently only in 240 meters of water depth. So any kind of sea level changes, of course, dramatically affect the environment on the shelf that is recorded at this one position where the site was drilled. And so with this one sea level change, we very curiously detected an increase in carbonates during sea level low stands that fall below 45 meters, which you then interpret to a, to a shift to more benthic dominated uh, shelf productivity. So we basically move from a more neric, um, open marine outer shelf environment that is more pelagic productivity dominated to a more benthic productivity dominated setting around this time when there is sea level low stands. And this very strictly tends to affect also the carbon neck concentration because there's basically more benthic um, organisms that get transported here, so large appendix foraminifers, um, various biovolves and gastrobots that just generally predominantly accumulate during the glacial low stands. Um, this is also reflected in our surface water temperatures that were donated by Ben Petrick and Alfredo Matias Casilla um, in this comparison. And there we actually see that we also increase the glacial interglacial variability in temperature drops uh, following this MPT event. And what we were primarily interested in this study was of course the effect of the sea level changes on the Lubin current directly. And for this, we were, think, uh, we were specifically looking at various paleo productivity records in the past that tended to affect um, the site U1460 during this time. Paleo productivity is a very interesting tracer for the Lubin current because of course it is a warm oligotrophic current that flows down. So any kind of changes in the strength of this current will also directly affect the nutrient conditions. This means the less intense the current gets, the more likely it is that um, classical upwelling Ekman transport, uh, upwelling through Ekman transport gets increased at U1460, thus potentially also increasing the productivity around this time. And to see these changes, we focused on organic matter accumulation rates and also our uranium content as an additional independent proxy, because uranium is of course directly related to organic matter through a complex process of complexation in the water column where basically uranium tends to bond with dissolved um, particulate organic matter that then gets transported into the sediment and preserved during various mineral phases. 
And what was very curious to us is that um, before this 900 kilo year event, so before this first dramatic sea level drops around 900,000 years ago, productivity around the west coast of Australia was relatively stable and very low. So in our understanding, this means that there was a very constant and warm looping current still affecting this site. But as soon as the sea level drop occurred, a very strong shift and an increase in productivity occurred after the sea level bounced back. So we, saw, we see a complete shift in how the um, environment responds following this 900 kilo event sea level low stand. And um, to show that this is apparently relatively unrelated to the global productivity records in glacial interglacial variability during the mid Pleistocene, we also plotted the um, Southern Ocean dust flux from ODP 1090 here, which basically reflects iron fertilization in the um, Southern Ocean sector of the world's ocean. And there we see that basically organic matter burial is not directly paced with these global dust records, but it is a very much local and maybe directly shelf signal that we can see here. And this is potentially very much reflected to different changes in surface water conditions around this time, which we all can also see in different sites. This is a tropical site, DSDP 214, which lies on the 90 East Ridge in the Indian Ocean. And there we also see very strong thermal climate changes during MIS 24 to MIS 22. So directly during the um, MPT, anti 900 kilo year event. And in our interpretation, this is a permanent increase in thermal climate tilting around this time, which then also favors upwelling and also the transport of nutrients to the surface through various eddy mixing, which also uh, occurs during times when the Lubin current is stronger in interglacials. And this specifically occurred after the 900 kilo year event. Um, this increase in productivity is also related to an increase in basically hemispheric uh, temperature gradients, meaning the stronger the gradient between the tropics and the high latitudes in the southern hemisphere became following the 900 kilo year event, the stronger our productivity records become. And this is not directly um, and easily interpretable with our uh, data and our understanding of how the interaction of the Lubin current should uh, work during glacial interglacial periods. So basically you have a reduced Lubin current because of glacial low stands and thus a reduced through flow through the Indonesian archipelago. So there might also be a different transport mechanism of general nutrients that might have reached U1460 um, following the MPT event and this is something that we then also would have wanted to have a look at. And beginning to unpuzzle this, um, we were able to actually um, look at productivity um, variabilities in direct contrast with our nanofossil accumulation rates, which we see here in this uh, solid green graph where we see that there's a definite increase following the 900 kilo event here, where we then have a increase in nanofossil accumulation rates and general productivity during the next sea level high stand. And this means that there is a significant shift in nutrient availability following the 900 kilo year event, and then also an associated return to more open marine and planktic productivity dominated settings. What is very interesting, however, here is that we have a very clear following glacial interglacial signal of overall accumulation in terms of both organic matter transport here as uranium signal, but also alkanones, which are also a productivity signal in this case, but 
haptophyte generated. And our calcareous nanofossils do not directly match this productivity record, but they do show spikes following the highest sea levels during interglacial, beginning at the gl interglacial towards glacial transition, where they show our highest abundances. And this was very interesting to us, and we do interpret this as a highly eddy-dominated regime around the Leuven current system, which transports nutrients in a still relatively open ocean system, which favors the, product, uh, the accumulation of calcareous nanofossils. And later on, when sea level drops further, productivity continues to be relatively high for different upwelling processes in the surface ocean. But this is then dominated no longer by classic open marine calcareous nanofossils that generate the alkinones, but also through coastal species. So there's also then again, a interaction of Lubin current strength, different sea level interactions, and also the local environmental conditions that we then have recorded in our site directly. And to further study this, and this is currently an ongoing research topic for us, we um, began to think how nutrients would actually arrive at the site, because even though there is upwelling, you also need to have a relatively nutrient enriched lower thermocline or you know, lower thermocline waters that have to transport the nutrients at the site U1460 actually. And what was quite interesting at site U1460 is that we, occur, uh, that we drilled a lot of uh, sponge remains in this case, and sometimes we've actually found in situ sponges. So we drilled into a sponge reef that occurred around the shelf areas, around 200 meter wa meters water depth in this interval that was otherwise surface water influenced by the Lewin current. And so this means in the lower area, there had to be relatively cold, um, a relatively cold current that established around sometime that favored the growth and establishment of various sponges in the area. And looking at the oceanographic conditions here, um, below the Lewin current, there is the so-called Lewin undercurrent, which is a northward flowing countercurrent below the Lewin current, which transports relatively oxygen rich cold waters from the subtropical and even uh, subantarctic transition zones uh, south of Australia northwards along this time. So the increase in sponge spicule and thus basically current adapted suspension feeders after the MPT, we then also relate to maybe a shift in the nutrient transport and potentially also the strength of this undercurrent. And this is also well reflected in our understanding of um, the preliminary um, benthic foraminifer data that you can see up here that we are currently in the process of generating with a PhD student of mine, where you see a very strong shift between um, detritus feeding planktonic foraminifera following the MPT event the, uh, versus uh, lower infonol and also facultative anaerobic uh, planktonic uh, benthic foraminifera, I'm sorry. Uh, benthic foraminifera before the MPT event. So there seems to be also a very strong change in this undercurrent. And the understanding how this undercurrent changes might be related to the MPT in general um, can be explained if you look at the oceanography of the um, Australian sector, so the South Australian sector around the Great Bight of Australia down here south because this is one of the formation regions of um, so-called subantarctic moat water in the Indian Ocean. This water is basically relatively cold water that subducts in the deep winter mixed layers around this uh, area between the Tasman Front and the subantarctic frontal system around the ACC which you can see here in this very red and strong current. Um, subducts and then gets transported through the so-called Flinders current along the Great Bight of Australia, which then flows into the open Indian Ocean, but also branches 
no food towards the so-called Lubin undercurrent. And so there's a direct relation to the amount of subantarctic malt waters that form compared to what we see in the surf, uh, bottom water conditions around U1460. And so our hope is that we can actually uh, improve our understanding of how the equator water transport of so pardon, of, of such sub-Antarctic mode waters and in, sorry, in extent also the Antarctic intermediate waters that form in the Pacific sectors might have changed during the MPT. So there we have actually an understanding of our intermediate water circulation that we can then also build upon in our further understanding of what was going on to this first dramatic sea level lows then during the middle Pleistocene transition and to maybe also begin to understand a bit further how this switch from a dominant 41 kilo year obliquity dominated glacial interglacial cyclicity to the very long uh, 100,000 quasi periodic cycles of the late Pleistocene occurred. And again, this is ongoing research in progress. And this is also something that my current PhD student is working on. And we're very keen on seeing further data about these things. Good. And this more or less concludes my talk at the moment. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. And if there are any kind of questions, I am, of course, happy to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Gerald. Um, it was really enlightening and um, very informative with a lot of information on the IODP. Um, okay, so I open the podium for questions. Someone. Since I don't see all the faces, just if you have a question, just go in and interrupt. I think it's the easier. I will ask a question. I would like to ask a question. Go ahead. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was a very interesting talk, full of data and interesting data. Um, you, you've drawn the impacts as if they are completely controlled by the, by the oceanic current. And you are looking, on, on the other hand, you're looking along the margin. Most of what you've worked, you worked along the margin. Uh, is there a modification that is imposed by the margin itself on this? Uh, do you see uh, the modification imposed by the margin on, on the environment that you're actually examining? Yes, very much so. So our main goal was to basically unpuzzle what was directly uh, related to margin changes for sea level change, and then also what was then additionally going on for oceanographic changes. I, if, I mean to ask, uh, yeah. do you see contribution that, uh, that contribute to, to, to the productivity, for example, uh, that come from the margin itself, that are associated with oh. the presence of the margin? I mean, does it change the environment, not just the sea level rise? Is there a is there an interaction here? Because you're looking at the deep, shallow uh, water transition and you should be pumping stuff out of the margin. Um, so you mean you, uh, the, the interaction with the shelf break directly or? With the margin, it's not just the shelf, it's the slope also, but yes. With yes, the, yeah, yeah, of course. With the break, with the break area, with the... Yeah. Does it does it uh, contribute to your uh, to your productivity record? Do you see uh, balancing yes, in our, in, or in our understanding definitely. So when there is increased Ekman transport, you will get of course more nutrients from the the, the margin coming up. Or do, or do you mean the direct continental contribution? Because this no, is yeah, like, okay. The Ekman yeah. is, is okay, but yeah. do you feel that it uh, mitigates or? or or uh, controls in any way the climatic uh, changes or, or is it uh, negligible with respect to the climatic changes? Mm -hmm. 
Is it, are the climate, are the, the environmental changes completely controlled by the, by the Pacific, uh, by the Pacific system or, or is the Australian margin actually uh, making a change here? No, no, no. Of course, the Australian margin is making a change here. I'm, I'm sorry for, a ma for maybe having misunderstood your question here in the beginning. No, no, this, these are mainly direct local processes that are, of course, then only modulate by the changes in the Lubin current. But the Lubin current is also directly linked to, to how the margin system itself behaves. So, of course, if you lower your sea level, you move of the, the position of the Lubin current attached to it a bit. So this is a local expression that is then also modulated by global processes. Thank you. More questions? Um, well, it seems that we don't have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will... Um, I will thank you very much again, Gerald. And uh, next week we we are staying in Israel uh, before jumping again to another talk uh, from abroad. So stay tuned, and thank you very much. <laughs> See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.